この番組はご覧のスポンサーの提供でお送りします。Alrighty, welcome everyone. I'm Tia Boo and I am here for Yori Moi, episode 8. As you can see, I am very blue because the very first frame of, I'm sorry, episode 9. I said episode 8. Well, last time was episode 8. This time's episode 9. The very first frame of episode 9 is blue sky with some clouds. And so, with blue background and blue shirt and blue eyes, everything, I, it, it, Every, everything is blue. d a b a d i d a b a d i So, very blue, but that will change shortly unless this entire episode is just blue screens. Last week, we,、uh, we were on a boat. We're, we're still on a boat. We're going to be on a boat for a little while. We might actually get off the boat today, but I, I don't really know.、Uh, we got some more wonderful moments of Shirase being terrible on camera and in public and with speaking and things.、Uh, learned some stuff about running and the way that, that members of the expedition crew keep themselves in shape and keep their stamina up during the travel portion. And after a day of Mostly not super notable stuff going on, just figuring out stuff gets lashed down around the rooms, and we got to help out with food prep, and we should probably exercise out on deck and stuff, and that's all a good idea. Our Dramamine wore off, and at that point,、uh, the sickness kicked in, and it was bad. It was very bad, and I think the show did a really good job of making the Making the, the, rocking, the rocking nature of this voyage really apparent to the audience. And、uh, from what some people said in the Discord and in the first couple of comments,、um, I, I said in the last episode that like, I'm not somebody who normally gets motion sick from video, but some people do, and some people might from that episode, and some people did because. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was a thing. It was also. It also resulted in some very cute moments, like uh, uh, Shiraishi just like dead on, on the, the cut, or uh, uh, Hinata with the wonderful gag where she's going to go outside and we think that she's being all like gung ho about it, like, I'm going to conquer this problem and then cut music, and nope, I'm just going to the, to the bathroom to puke again. Bah.、Um, and then our, our thing kind of hits its peak, our. <clears throat> Our nausea and seasickness hits its very, very peak, and our girls all together kind of collapse into each other. And, um, <coughs> ah, I've got something stuck in my throat. Ah, or maybe it's just dry. I don't know. Ah, crap. Okay, um, they, that, that's better. My eyes are watering, though. This is really miserable.、Oh, fuck. Okay. So they collapsed into each other and then, and then started to, to joke a little bit and found some humor in the moment.、Uh, the, the initial joke being that they will tell everybody back home how wonderful expedition ships are is kind of like, ah ha ha, you don't know what you're getting in for.、Um, so, so, what we get from this is like a, a shared experience. This is difficult in the moment, and a character says this outright. This is difficult in the moment, but we'll all look back and laugh on it. Later. This will be a, a shared experience, an in joke of sorts that we can have together. And it's, it's one of our first really big things like that. And it, it bonds our group together. It feels solidified and it's nice. I like it. And with that、uh, sentiment in their heads, they open the door, which is a really terrible idea in the middle of a horrible, horrible, terrifying storm where they definitely could have been swept off deck by any stray random wave or whatnot. But they didn't because it's a show, it's fiction, it's fine.、Uh, and it resulted in a wonderful moment as the insert song kicks in and the waves are blasting, and they find in that moment joy in the unknown. And that's, that's something that I want to talk about rather briefly, but I just, I just want to mention it because it's a thought that I had when I was writing down my notes. Because often, With a week in between episodes, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes at the beginning of this before I start recording. I'll just go through the episode again and just be, just like refresh myself on key points and take down little notes、um, for what I want to talk about in the beginning discussion. And I got to this sequence where, where they go outside. And the thing that stood out to me on rewatch or skim, I guess, was the joy on their faces, the excitement, and, and this. Passion and exuberance as they're staring out into darkness and turmoil and storm and terror and death. It's the unknown out there, and they're excited about that. And I think, I think that's really interesting because it made me think about how we as people, we as humans, interact with the unknown. And it made me realize that we, we, we have almost like a binary. 
a, a, almost a binary reaction to the unknown. Either we are afraid of it and we avoid it at all costs, or we are excited by it and we run toward it. And we can flip between one to the other, but as long as something is something we don't understand, either we're desperate to understand it and bring it into the, the realm of our own our comprehension of the world, or we're terrified of it and we don't want anything to do with it. Here, boom, they, they went 100% onto the side of joy and exuberance and excitement. And I, I just love it. I just really love that moment. It's really cool. Okay, I just wanted to talk about that because it's really good. And then there's one last thing, which is the very ending scene. Again, as they usually are in Yori Moi so far, it is understated with no dialogue, just a slow shot of Gein looking out over the waves, holding a glass dome full of flowers. I assume preserved flowers. I assume as a memorial for Takako. So that's, that's leaning into the heavy stuff, but... There's ice on the horizon. We are about to arrive in Antarctica, or kind of close to it. I assume that there's a bunch of ice around it as well that we're going to have to navigate through before we can actually set feet on ice with solid stuff underneath. But I don't really know. So we're almost there. We're almost, we're almost at the place. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of waiting on bated breath for us to actually set foot on ice. Uh, once, once we do, I've got a, a thing that I'm planning to do with the, uh, the, the shout out thing at the beginning, which may happen at the beginning, of, the beginning of this episode, depending on whether they step on ice. But you'll see if you see it or not. I don't know. Uh, let's watch episode eight, oh, nine. Again, I did it. Uh, let's watch episode 9. I've got the episode up and ready to go. It's sitting at zero seconds. There will be two versions of this reaction. Picture-in-picture picture version with video up there. Linked in the description. Tower-based version on YouTube. If you want to do a sinky thing, sync up your own copy with the beep-beep timer. You can do that. Just get your copy ready because the beep-beep timer to count you down will be coming at you now. Besuboru. Oh, the jump rope competition. That's right. <laughs> sure, so it just pieces out. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Let's get out of fish tier. Because <laughs> that's not steak. Ah, she wasn't piecing out. She's a, a prodigy. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have predicted it. Fair point. Also fair point. Also fair point. Also fair point. Jesus, he get yell yell. Is this the roast of? Oh, I don't think so. That ain't the cake. Gonna talk to her about Takako. Ha. Okay. I I guess we have a love confession to share a say. Dude Dude Bro is an adult, right? Like they're the only high schoolers on this trip, right? So that's a little weird. Unless he's in love with somebody else and he needs her help. I don't think so. Oh, that's the... That's the jump rope competition. Okay. <sighs> that one frame, man. It's too good. I would like to know who put that one scene of Hinata winking at the camera in the OP so that I can uh, uh, shake their hand. Because <laughs> that, that is true genius.
an Antarctic love story blizzard arc. We're having an arc? Okay, so he is in love with Gin. <laughs> yeah, nope. That captain? The one who's way out of your league? Yeah, are, are you sure? Oh, yeah, good. I mean, yeah, all right. What? What? Hey, I mean, look, if you're into femdom, you can be into femdom. There's nothing wrong with that. There, that is not good. Yeah. What? How would we help? Uh, I, I, I don't think... Since she was a child, right? Yeah. But they're not... Oh, come on. Good. Right now. Get the fuck away. Yeah, makes perfect sense. But I think that you should go and talk to her. Because you didn't really know your mother either. Ooh. Oh, no. The, for good reason. Oh, man. We're going to turn this into reality TV on, on deck. Everyone loves stuff like that. Yeah, they do. <laughs> You'll just embarrass yourself, bud. <laughs> I was wondering what's going on, why we had her hair coming out of his head. That's a cool shot. I'm going to write that down. Five minutes. That's a thing, though. That's a thing, though. That's an opportunity for you to... Uh... I see. <laughs> how do you deal with childs? <laughs> how, how does children... <laughs> no, she just didn't get it. She didn't realize that you were playing a game. Hmm. Also sounds like cornering somebody who maybe doesn't want to talk about those things. Oh no. Yeah, I disagree with that choice as well. At least not on an interview. Like, they should talk, but... Huh. <laughs> same conversation. Literally the same conversation. <laughs> hmm. Just stare. Just watch videos. Aw. Okay, but they're of one mind, though. I can tell. <laughs> that much is obvious. Takako just wanted, she just wanted me to take care of her when she was away, but now she's away, dude. Oh. Oh. And Shira Say is not here. Oh, she is here. No, she's not. Okay. 
Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it is related. <laughs> oh no, you little gremlins. <laughs> they got her. They they definitely are. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, le le leave her be. All right, we're getting closer. Denser and denser ice. Mmm, we've reached that level. Okay. Hit. Yeah, there are. But what does she mean? Hmm. He knew about that too. This will build to them actually talking at the end of the episode. Okay. It's just a lack of communication between them. Thank you, other captain. Good advice from someone who knows. All right, Shirase has been absent from camera for most of this episode. There she is. first penguins what up penguin ah that's great <laughs> very helpful huh Is this the past? Yeah. Hmm? Oh? She was jumping rope even then. Did she teach her? Mama. Uh, are we are we listening in? Eavesdropping. <laughs> Shh. Huh. If that's the truth. Good. That that's nice. Oh. 
Okay. Yeah. Responsibility doesn't mean fault. Necessarily. That you want to go? Or that you forgive me? Of course. Oh. We hit our first real iceberg. Sweet. Wow, that was a thing. Well. Ah. Start breaking through. Vroom vroom. Oh, what a moment. Then you're fucked. <laughs> okay, got it. Cool. So that works metaphorically as well. Good. Good. Uh, uh, I need to write down something. Again. Again. Yes, I am aware of the Second World War. <laughs> sure. Sure. Huh. A little bit. More like marginalization, but sure. Okay. Challenges on the country, on the nation level. Right. So our experience is a microcosm of the, the country's experience. And this is her rubbing off on, on Shirase, her spirit. Hmm. Nandomo, Nandomo. Breaking a path, ramming our way through. Boom, boom. Yeah. I, I'm into this. Huh? Always. Waiting for her to get home. And she's... Oot. What the... Again and again. Ooh. But that one time... Couldn't go again. Had to make the call.
Not the time, bud. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Back away. Back away. Back away. Time to run. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Fuck yeah. That's Antarctica, baby. Yeah, but it's still Antarctica, baby. Uh-huh. Welcome to the cold. Endless ice. First step. Do it. One small step for high school's high school girl. One giant leap for high school girl kind. Hmm. <laughs> you step together. Oh. Aww. Yeah, this is the 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 end game for years for her. Not quite, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Promised you would say it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. For sure. Yeah. Everybody going to join? Fuck yeah. All of like mind. Everybody's in this together. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, that's good.
You have a new message from Shiraishi Tamiko. That's uses uses mom. Shiraishi Sora Yori. Yuzuki Shiraishi. Tamiko Shiraishi. Yep, that's her mom. Okay. Interesting. So I wonder if that means that there's maybe some kind of like ulterior motive play going on here. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what that mail is. I don't know what that message is. It's maybe ominous. Maybe not at all. I don't know. Okay. I love this episode. I love it to pieces. I really like it. I will say, however, that there is something interesting about this episode. I think... And I'm, I'm going to have to go through and skim it again to to determine that this is true. But I think, after first watch, coming out at the end, my least favorite part of the episode is also my favorite part of the episode. <laughs> this is a very thing, a strange thing to say. Um, Zaizen. Zaizen. Yeah, Zaizen Toshio. This guy. Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, I think his existence in this episode is my least favorite part of the episode. However, it is also the central linchpin that enables and motivates everything else that happens in the episode, which is kind of neat. Kind of kind of really neat. So, what don't I like? I, I don't like him. I don't like him and I'm I, I I feel that that's intentional that I am not meant to like him necessarily i mean maybe to empathize with him a little bit somebody who's who's hopelessly uh and infatuated with a uh, somebody who's who's out of their reach but more importantly somebody they don't really know uh and it's made clear to us by his quick flip-flop at the end where he goes literally sentence to sentence from i was really serious about it to wait but you'll work uh it indicates to us that he's not very serious but his whole his whole love struck thing that he's got going on is very annoying to me and and somewhat cringy um and his like desperation to to get with girl is is a big no no but a couple of things now now i I want to make it clear that his love of strong women and feeling like strong women might protect him is not the problem here that's that's fine I mean like however you want power balance in a relationship is is good do do whatever you feel bottle I, I don't I don't really like his existence I think mostly it's it's well, it's mostly that, but it's partly also just a gut reaction to the introduction of romance in any form to the show. Especially given that our first introduction uh, kind of implies, kind of misleads me. I won't say that it implies, it might not be intentional. But it misled me into thinking that he was confessing to uh, Shirase, which he is not. Which is just awkward. I don't want a character to be in love with my, my group of girls. They're... They're, they're doing a thing and it's pure. Keep it pure. And we do manage to do that by the end of the episode with this guy. But his motivation for being in love with Gein sparks the, the idea for them to interview all the people on, on board and talk about their love lives, which leads to them going to interview her and them pressuring Shirase to be the one to interview her, which leads to her absence for a large portion of the episode, which leads to tension being built uh, for the inevitable confrontation between Gin and Shirase, which leads to that confrontation being really, really emotionally impactful because it's so simple. Uh, because there's so much buildup to what ends up being a really simple uh, interaction. And the simplicity of the interaction in the present is not indicative of, like, 
the complicated context of that interaction, which brings brings context from Shirase's childhood and the moments that she spent with Gein, uh, the the jump roping and their talks about her mother and uh, Gein's own feelings about her mother and Gein's feelings of of guilt and. Uh, responsibility for having lost a member of her team um, given that we we get the the reveal that she is the one who called off the search of course she feels responsible but and I said this during the reaction I think it's it's the perfect line for this responsibility in a a I am responsible for the safety of my crew sense does not mean guilt when something goes wrong right like there they're they're separate you might be responsible for for the safety of your crew but you are not at fault if something occurs that you could not have prevented right and it seems like like takako was like a good researcher who knew what she was doing she just got in too deep and and fucked herself over or chose something or chose to die out there that's a really interesting wrinkle but all of that, all of that is sparked by the existence of this funky character who is almost a, a comedic relief character, but sparks the entire flow of the episode. That's really interesting to me. Because at first glance, I do not like him. He just functions as, as a bit of a funny guy for her to, to comey all over. But then bits and pieces of additional context get added in. Bits and bobs. The moments together. The, the moment with the blocks that indicates that they really can't understand each other. And then this moment as they're both watching and they exclaim in the same, at the same time, a penguin, right? It indicates that while they're not communicating, they're on the same page. They just don't know it, right? They're thinking the same way. They're more the same person, I think, than either of them are close to to Shirase's mother, really. And it seems, just from what we've seen, that Gin almost raised Shirase more than Takako, right? That's just the impression that we get from the scenes that we see. Obviously, it's probably not true, but she was around, right? And there was awkwardness and distance, but there are the elements, the building blocks of bridges between them. A shared love of certain things. Moments that they do relate to each other. And... And then there's this line. This is a really interesting one. The way that it's cut off. Yeah. That's an interesting one. And it, it's interesting because it it adds more to our relationship between Gin and Kaide. Gin tries to kind of deflect, right? All that Takako wanted, she starts to say. We can we can assume that she was going to finish that with something like she just she just wanted somebody to be around, or she just wanted my spirit to rub off on her, whatever. But Kaide cuts her off. No, 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 none of that justification stuff. Let's get to the core of the matter. Are you sure you don't want to talk to her? That's so good. Forces her to reach out. And to face, to face the possibility that during that confrontation at the end of the episode, the possibility in her mind that Shirase turns to her and goes, yes, I blame you for my mother's not being around, and I consider you her murderer. She could have done that. I mean, we know that she probably won't because we know Shirase better than that. But Keen doesn't necessarily. So of course she's afraid. Of course there's trepidation. Wow. <laughs> the little things like playing with the with the eye slider. So funny. So weird. Ah, 
I'm going to spend way too much time trying to think about what this line means. You can't grab hold of one, but look up and they'll always be there. Something permanent but unreachable? That's her type, she says. Hmm. I don't know. I'll let it simmer. I'll let it simmer. Get some really good advice from uh, the other captain, which is wonderful. And then this stuff, and then this stuff, and then the actual confrontation. Which is a hell of a moment. And Shirase reveals she knew what was happening. It could be dangerous. She might not come back. I can't blame you for that. Why would I blame you for that? But to say these things out loud, it's, it's the first time we've seen Shirase really, really address the truth, which is that her mother is gone and not coming back. It's the first time we've seen her really verbalize it. And she does so in a very mature, kind of stoic way. Until. Until it becomes too much. It's not even. It's not even denial of her mother's death, right? It's denial of her own her own section of confusing, twisted feelings. Grief and loss and sadness. And all of those things, I, I, I get the impression from Shira saying, I've had this impression from the beginning once we, we kind of realized that her mother was gone. Gone, gone. I get this impression from Shira say that, um... I completely just forgot what I was about to say. Holy shit. Okay. I get the impression from Shira say that she's uncomfortable with her own emotions um, because they're difficult to handle and has for a long time repressed everything related to the loss of her mother. Um, we get we get some indicators of that in the sequence where, where she talks about it being just the same. Even though my mother wasn't coming home anymore, even though I knew that I wasn't waiting for her anymore, it was just the same. I was still waiting, still waiting for her to return. And what I get from this is... Not quite denial, but a lack of belief. Like, it can't possibly be true. Combined with an inability to actually functionally address the emotions that she feels. And so she, she buries it all away. And it seems like a lot of those emotions she's turned into and wrapped up into this complex around getting to Antarctica. And she's turned this into like a section of her identity and her goals. But a whole bunch of it is is unexplored feelings about her mother. And by extension about Gein and about the expedition and about Antarctica as a whole. As much as this is an external exploratory adventure to go to Antarctica, it's also an internal journey for her to discover the things that, that she can't without actually going to location, Right? She can't fathom the facts of it. Not until she's there, she thinks. And so it becomes an obsession. And it's an obsession that's fueled by all of the... I mean, you can think of, of those emotions, the repressed ones, almost in the terms of potential and kinetic energy, right? In the same way that we think of, of uh, youth flowing, right? <clears throat> all those repressed, repressed emotions are, are potential en energy that's been building and building and building and building. And she's turned it into kinetic energy directed toward going to Antarctica in the hope of getting some kind of answers. Hmm. Hmm. It's interesting. 
Okay, and then I think there are two other major things. Again, again. The whole again, again sequence. The whole thing is so dope. It's so dope. Push the buttons. Whirring up. Climbing on the ice. Building, 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 building. And then there's this scene. Oh, it's the audio that sells it for me. It's it's the resounding, crumbling. Oh, oh. the scale of it, you know. Now it's only chipping away, right? Only making incremental steps. But in time, incremental step after incremental step, again and again, pushing and pushing, it will break through this gigantic, insurmountable ice sheet. That's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty cool. It works as a, it's a little bit of a metaphor for the whole show, you know, just like a little bit, like a tiny bit. It just happens to function on like seven different levels where it functions for the expedition as a whole. It functions for our group of girls individually. It functions for Shirase individually. It functions for the previous expedition with Kin and, and everybody as well. And it functions for Japan on, on the world stage post-World War II when Antarctica was being actually divided up and they got the shittiest, uh, shittiest draw possible. And in your face, baby, we'll still do it. Persistence. Endless persistence. What happens if the ice doesn't break? What if we fail? And we do it again. <laughs> oh! And it's a hard journey. It's maybe maybe a hard, the hardest journey that we could make here. Why are we going that way? No choice. She caught a gun eye. We got to do. Got to do it. even said to be unreachable where have we heard that before it's impossible you can't do it <gasps> oh is that the core motivation for one of our characters what crazy so this gives us it gives it gives a sense that there's more at stake here it gives a sense that more than our characters' hopes and dreams are riding on this, and riding on this one single step that they take. And I think that the, the comparison to the moon landing is apt and intentional. Uh, the idea that there is the weight of the world watching you as you do something. In this case, it's not quite the world watching, but there is a weight of expectation. There is a, a history of people persevering against the odds to get to where we are going. And we're trying to write the next line of that history. That's cool. That's neat. I like it. Again and again, step by step, driving, driving. It's awesome. It's awesome. And then we have this moment. You having trouble? So we realize what Gein taught her. What did Gein, what, what part of Gein rubbed off on Shira say? Perseverance, relentless, stubborn. Try, try again. Nice. Nice. Very nice. And she does so. Just resets, gets back at it. And all she can do is smile. All Takako does is, is give her a little smile. Ah. Gin's rubbed off. It's been done. It worked. <sighs> and then there's this scene. In the middle of the storm. The blizzard arc, eh? Searching, searching. And then the radio crackles. She's alive. She's out there. She's in range. But all she says is, it's so beautiful. 
What did she see out there? What was she looking at? Why wasn't she trying to come home? Why wasn't she trying to tell somebody where she was? Was she stuck somewhere? Foot stuck in a crevasse? Injured? Don't know. No idea. And because she, because Gein never found her, she doesn't know either, does she? Forever a mystery, huh? What did she see out there? What do you see? All I can think of... <laughs> All I can think of is the the scene from Sunshine. It's, it's actually it's one of my favorite scenes in film. Period. Uh, yeah, the what do you see scene, Canada? What do you see? What do you see? Hmm. Yeah. I'll I'll put a shout out here. If you have not seen the film Sunshine, uh, uh, from 2007, you need to. You really need to. It's, uh, it takes place in, like, 2057. A group of astronauts is sent on a second mission to throw all of the, 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 the nuclear bull material on Earth in a giant bomb into the middle of the sun because the sun is dying. And they go on this journey, and it's pretty fucking crazy. Uh, it's it's really good. But there's a sequence where where they have to do a repair on the ship, and based because of some circumstances, uh, one of the characters ends up on the front of their their heat shield, bit which they're trying to repair because if they don't repair it, the whole ship is gonna burn up. But he's on the front of the repeat the 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 heat shield, and they they can't save him. The, the sun is rising, essentially, and he's about to be exposed to the full brunt of our star right in front of him. The most glorious and terrifying thing in existence. The closest thing that we have to a real-world example of, of God, right? A power so far beyond us that we can't even comprehend it. And it's just a ball of fire. And in the sequence... In the last moments, before his his spacesuit, his spacewalk suit, goes out, uh, the guy on comms in the ship, who has been obsessed with the sun and interested in it in almost a spiritual way, all he does, all he asks is, Canada, what do you see? What do you see? Tell me what you see. He's just desperate to know what that view looks like. That view, moments before death, of seeing greatness, power, incomprehensible. And Kanada never responds. The character on comms never gets to find out what he sees. But we do. The camera shows us. We see a wave of fire engulf him. And it's amazing. It's beautiful. This reminds me of that moment. Again, we have two characters communicating only by, by audio comms. One of them inside where it's safe. One of them outside where it's dangerous. Where they're unable to get back and they know it. And the only thing that they can converse about, the only thing that they want to talk about, is the beauty. The majestic beauty of something bigger than them. Scarier than them. Again, it's the joy in the unknown. Again, it's the joy in the unknown. But we don't get to see what Takako sees. We don't get to know. We might never. 
not unless not unless unless we get it in a a a, a meta sort of way. We would have to have like Shira say see something and say that exact say the exact same line in the same way and that would be a pretty clear indicator to us that whatever she's looking at is probably the same thing that Takako was was seeing I would guess that it's probably the Aurora because that was a big focus in the first couple episodes going and seeing the Aurora partly because of its rarity ah <sighs> Wow. Bit of a roller coaster of an episode. Go goofy bits abound, for sure. And then some of the biggest emotional impact moments that we've had so far. On both sides of things. On the, the heartbreak and crushing side of things, with the moment where Cherise, uh breaks down, realizing she doesn't understand how she feels. And this moment, where... Gosh, it's, it's like, there's almost hope, right? But all she says is it's beautiful. Oof. Oof. And then on the other side of the spectrum is the, the super gung-ho again, again, in your face moment where the, the whole crew cheers along with them after they take their first step onto ice. That's fucking awesome. Where Shirase breaks out and, and a bunch of her emotion flows out as indignation and, and, like, righteous fury. Fuck yeah. Good shit. Ah. Okay, and then there's one last thing I want to look at, which is just at five minutes, there's a little clever thing with the hair. <laughs> just... Just right here. Yeah. This is this is really fun. <laughs> because because her hairstyle is really just that section on I guess it's it's the right side of her head. It's just it's just this over here, right? Just this. And so we see him with that, and it just looks like her. <laughs> it's freaking great. Very goofy. Also, a total non sequitur and has nothing to do with anything else in the episode. <sighs> but this is a really excellent episode. The whole perseverance sequence is, is amazing. The whole interaction between D Gin and, and Shirase is fantastic. The moment at the end where... where we find out what we find out is heartbreaking. The moment where Shirase breaks down is heartbreaking. All of these little moments in the past with young Shirase, with, with Gin and Takako, are wonderful. And they add a whole lot of context, um, emotional and narrative context, for, for their relationship and for other things. This is a really good one. Really, really good one. Okay. A uh, final thing to do would be to just go and look for interesting things among staff list. And uh, if there's nothing interesting, we will end there. So let me look. Okay. So this episode was storyboarded by um, um, Kenichi Shimizu, who also did 6 and 12, and then was episode directed by Taisik Kang, who did episode 4, which is the one where they go, uh, like, orienteering, and that has that really excellent moment with Kimari and Gin talking on the rock that eventually leads into the big, the big open landscape shot, which I thought was really good. Um, and that, that kind of makes sense to me, because... Uh, again, we have a really, a really wonderful sequence that's very, very big and sound oriented with the icebreaker actually breaking ice, um, and, and going through. Yeah, these, these big wides with the, the sound and the impact and stuff, really good. Whole episode really good. But that, that kind of tracks for me that, that this is Taisik Kang's work and Mamoru Kambi on, on storyboard. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Very cool. Okay. I think that's about it. I think that's about all I've got. Um, there are a couple of other little things, like the the uh, the bookends of the jumping rope and um, the penguins, both of them saying penguins at the same time. Those together are both, both really good. Uh, 
showing us a bit of a relationship between Gein and, and Shirase, and that works super well. All in all, stellar episode on an emotional level, on a comedic level, on a just, that was really cool, looking and sounding and feeling level. Good vibes. Good good vibes all throughout this episode. Um, definitely some emotional impactful emotionally impactful moments though. I can I can imagine that some people would have probably uh, let the waterworks flow for this one. Um, not my thing. Not yet. hasn't hasn't gotten me on that level yet. But we shall see if it gets there. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. In any case, I think that's where where we'll wrap. Mitiabu, this Soriori Motoi Basho. Episode 9. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I hope to catch you next week for episode 10. See you there. Peace.